and by the way, my name is Casey Harden. I'm uh, an engineer with Trans Systems working on the Oxford uh, Route 67 Alternative Transportation Study with the Main Street Committee, who uh, will be leaving part of the presentation tonight. Um, I think perhaps, um, you know, if First Selectman Temple wants to say a few words, this would be a good time to let him do that. You should I think I just unmuted myself. There we go. That's good. That's okay. good. All right. Wait, uh, are we waiting for anyone? You know, I think at this point we've got 17 guests in, you know, quite a few of them are DOT, but, you know, I think I do see some names I haven't seen before. So, um, you know, it is okay. 7 seven ten. Maybe we should go ahead and if you want to say a few words to start. Okay, well, um, I guess I, we can start at, we're at the beginning. Um, it's always been um, curious to me about Oxford that we were kind of uh, the land between Seymour and Southbury and, um, and, and not much uh, to actually define the town of Oxford. Uh, and I went and uh, talked to uh, Kathleen about that and said, you know, are there any grants that we can get to, uh, to uh, put passive re recreation uh, of parks or whatever in, um, in downtown Oxford now. And um, she, she did a great job, put it all together. And that's kind of where we are now. Um, I'm really thinking, and this is why I wanted to talk to everyone tonight, um, I'm really giving strong consideration to expanding the project uh, and and have this committee handle the expansion of um, because we now have the center school as town property. And uh, what I want to do with the center school is uh, put the police department there, the park and recreation and the board of ed. The board of ed has already started uh, that right now. They, they, they have an office there. And um, we have been talking to a contractor who was willing to take down the buildings, the outbuildings um, by the center school or the campus, as they say, and uh, level, the, level the entire um, hill at no cost for us. Uh, and, and he would get to use uh, what, what he takes out of there and gravel or, and or rock or whatever, but we will be left with a flat piece of property uh, that can really dovetail very well into the the Main Street project now, uh, and it it can not it can incorporate both passive and um, uh, active, uh, and, you know, uh, recreation. <clears throat> um, it is. One one of the thoughts in the back of my mind is to uh, I'd like to put a pool in back there for the town, and I'd like to put in some uh, playing more playing fields for the kids, uh, and uh, you know that entire area would be opened up. But of course, we do have the uh, uh, the project that we're working on now, which is uh, you know uh, putting trails through the woods. And uh, uh, you know, identifying wildlife and uh, and keeping the uh, uh, keeping the area as pristine as possible, allow fishing, allow uh, uh, hiking, etc. So I think that that what I'm my, my vision is here that this will be um, uh, an attraction to the and 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 would differentiate us from. Uh, a lot of other towns, uh, an attraction for the town of Oxford. And, uh, you know, we already had that with the quarry walk. Uh, that, you know, one of the things I wanted to do there was to have a green. And I, eventually I'd like to see all of this connected in the quarry walk so that we can have uh, very long walking trails 
uh, and um, and basically a an area uh, that uh, uh, that would uh, would really mark and identify us as a uh, community, and I think it's very attainable. Uh, the um, the problem, of course, is money. Uh, you know, we're we're in a you know we don't know what's going to go on with the COVID and whether these grants are going to dry up or whatever. Uh, but um, you know, the town is in pretty good financial shape right now, uh, and I don't anticipate getting in bad financial shape. So um, you know, that's where I'm coming from. Uh, and I, you know, I really appreciate the work of this committee because you, this committee has done a terrific job. Uh, c uh, come up with um, several um, uh, little uh, twists and bends that I, I hadn't even thought of, um, and, and um, you know, it, it, it really, they really have uh, enhanced the entire idea of having this kind of uh, centralized area. So. But anyway, uh, once again, thank you to the committee and, uh, and um, you know, please enjoy the presentation. Thank you, George. Yeah, thank you. Um, and again, my name is Casey Harden from Trans Systems. We're a consultant working for the Nautisot Valley Council of Governments and uh, the town committee as well. Uh, just up on the screen here, of course, I've got the, just some ground rules. Just wanted everyone to understand, you know, the meeting is being recorded. That'll allow us to put it up on the web for folks to view it who couldn't make it tonight. Um, everyone's on mute by default. Uh, we will be able to pause a couple different times to allow us to take questions. If you come up with a question uh, that you, you don't want to forget it, you don't want to wait till we break, there's a conversation tool. There's like a little speaky thing that comes up. I believe it's the second tool from the left. You can enter it in the chat and we'll read it out. Uh, there's also a little hand you can do to raise your hand, and I can see who has their hand raised, and I can unmute you and allow you to, to ask the question once we get there. And again, there'll be about two uh, Q&A periods. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Kathleen O'Neill from the town committee and let her uh, introduce um, you know, what their presentation consists of. Good evening. <clears throat> my my name is Kathy O'Neill. I'm the grant writer uh, for the town of Oxford and the chair for for our Oxford Main Street uh, project committee. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to this collaboration between uh, Oxford Main Street <clears throat> project committee, uh, Trans Systems, and Naugatuck uh, Valley Council of uh, Governments. Um, We've worked very hard for the last six weeks uh, to pr get these presentations to you. Trend System is represented by Casey Harding, the project manager, and Aaron Boot is the senior re regional uh, planner, represents uh, the Naugatuck Valley uh, Council of Governments. Um, you're going to see a presentation by the Oxford Main Street Committee uh, that was created by Mary Lopresti, uh, uh, Mary is a retired educator, has worked tirelessly uh, over the years for Oxford and <clears throat> is now the Oxford Main Street uh, Secretary. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, this uh, presentation that Mary is presenting will give you a little historical view of how did this uh, happen. Uh, and uh, I think you're going to enjoy it. And then where are we going with it? Uh, one thing that we uh, found out uh, before we, uh, after we did this presentation is that we are now going to be a, a trying for another grant that will extend the project even further. Uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce the Oxford Main Street presentation.
So that's um, it for that portion of the presentation. So I um, want to, I, I have two raised hands. So I'd like to start and allow them to ask. So I'm going to start with Mary Beth Nelson. I'm going to uh, make you a presenter, which will allow you to unmute yourself. You will still have to click that uh, microphone button to be able to talk. OK, my, my que question was just I was wondering who was on this um, presentation because I'm only seeing six names, but you mentioned there were 17 people and I wasn't sure how to find out who else is on there. Yeah, so there's um, for some reason, it seems like Microsoft Teams restricts viewing the full attendee list to anyone who's not a presenter. Um, we will be circulating a, a like a report a meeting with an attendee list if, if that's all right. We do have yeah we have about eighteen people right now on on the list. Okay, the only reason I asked is because I had reached out to some people in the last few days to attend this. I wasn't sure if they were here. I wanted to be sure I can follow up and share this this presentation with them later on. Sure thing, and we intend to uh, you know like I said we're recording it and we're going to get it posted on the website. So that should be another avenue if we, you know, people weren't able to make it tonight. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I uh, I see the other person uh, who had their hand raised no longer has their hand raised. I'm wondering if that was one of the folks who was just asking a few questions there in the um, there in the chat. Um, Kathleen, you have your hand raised. Do yeah, you wanna... you would, uh, I just wanted to question that gray, this gray blockage that came out on the presentation. Hopefully, if we have to use it again, that, that won't happen. Because obviously, it wasn't in the presentation, you know? Yeah, so what happens is Microsoft Teams meters what it shows people based on their internet connection. And if Microsoft Teams thinks your internet's too slow, it like doesn't show... For example, sometimes it won't show a video stream, like when we're all sharing our web cameras. So I think what may have happened is it may have sort of decided on its own to not show the video, which is sort of unfortunate. And um, but but in the recording, it will um, it will all show up. And I do. I was chatting with a couple of people as we were going. And it looked like a, a, a few people could see it. So I'm pretty confident it'll show up in the live. recording. Well, too, I, I want to offer to the. Uh... <clears throat> to the audience that uh, when we, uh, our website is going to be launched very soon. And of course the town has our website and we're going to be uh, offering um, fundraising, uh, volunteer time. So whether it's, you know, to buy a, a memorial brick or a memorial bench, uh, a plaque, or it's to join uh, Jim Sanders has, uh, has been, Tremendous in in offering uh, uh, volunteer work, um, and very soon in November, uh, Northeast uh, Horticultural will be in that area, uh, starting the site work by taking down uh, the diseased trees, and uh, it's going to be very exciting. Uh, we're going to have a whole program on how to get rid of the invasives uh, under the tutelage of uh, um, Stacy Marcel. So there'll be all kinds of opportunity to join in and become a part of uh, Oxford Main Street Project. Girl Scouts are coming in. Uh, Joelle, uh, email, I haven't talked to her personally yet, but we're going back and forth on email. So <clears throat> uh, if you're interested, uh, please uh, check out our website uh, later, but uh, it, you're gonna have uh, be very proud of, of what, what's going to happen in our town center. <clears throat> no, and you, exactly. always, you could always contact me, grantadmin at oxford-ct.gov. Oh, thanks, Kathleen. That was a good, um, uh, a good addition there. Um, so I, I think with with that in mind, we're gonna uh, pivot forward to a presentation um, by the Oxford uh, Route 67 Alternative Transportation Study, which is working hand in hand with the. Uh, Main Street Committee here in town, and um, I'm going to let Aaron uh, Boudres say a few words. He's the project manager uh, from the Nautilus Valley Council of Governments. Thanks, Casey. So, 
Yeah, so I work for the Naugatuck Valley Council of Governments and we do transportation planning for, for the region, including Oxford. Um, you know, we noticed uh, several years ago that, you know, there were some really great things happening in Oxford, like the, uh, the um, uh, Nature Preserve and Quarry Walk. We also noticed the town was applying for um, or was pursuing grant funding for bike and pedestrian improvements along Route 67. Um, and in sort of doing so in, in little little sections along Route 67, we sort of saw a need to step back and sort of develop a plan for the for the whole corridor, looking at bike and pedestrian uh, improvements and transit improvements in in the entire Route 67 area. Um, you know, the the focus is really on developing concepts that are safe, feasible, and constructible, and provide access to important destinations. Um, and you know, especially since it is it is a state route, um, and the the intent is really to provide the town with an overall plan for improvements, uh, complete with cost estimates and a phasing plan, so that you know, future developments are are more attractive to funders. So NBCOG used transportation planning funds that were that were uh, made available through the DOT to fund this uh, Route 67 alternate alternative transportation study. Uh, we're really happy to have Trans Systems on board as the project consultant, and I'll hand it back over to Casey to, to talk about the details. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, right, so you know we have a, a presentation, probably about 15, 20 minutes, uh, starting with uh, just our analysis of, of what's going on, on out there today on Route 67. And again, our, our study limits are, are essentially Route 67 uh, throughout Oxford, so from the South Ferry to the Seymour Town Line, you know, with some additional goals in terms of making sure we provide connections to uh, both the Naugatuck River Greenway down in Seymour, uh, as well as the Larkin State uh, State Park Trail up in Southbury. Um, so today, again, talking talk a little bit a little bit about existing conditions. Uh, we'll tell you about some of the initial routing analysis we've done for a multi-use trail along Route 67 and the Little River. Uh, talk about uh, transit and some of the things we've looked at in terms of how we could help mobility within the town by providing a, a transit service, and then talk to you about where, where our study goes from here. So starting uh, with the roadway itself, um, it's, you know, some relatively high traffic volumes out there. It's uh, Route 67 is classified as a minor arterial. It's, you know, designed to move traffic from point to point. Um, on the bottom of the slide here, those are uh, traffic volumes, daily traffic volumes. And uh, Southbury and the northwest is to the left, Seymour, the southeast to the right. And you can see that line, that graph uh, higher in this area down towards Seymour, where that commercial activity starts to pick up. There is a, a bit of a bump in the middle towards that Oxford Center, and then uh, the volumes do decrease towards uh, Southbury. Uh, speeds are relatively high. Uh, through the corridor, as, as, as I'm sure many of you know, especially those of you who have uh, done much walking or biking along Route 67. The speed limits themselves are about 45 miles an hour north of Oxford Center, 40 miles an hour south of Oxford Center, and uh, 35 through uh, Oxford Center. You know, if we, we gathered a bunch of data through um, this data application called Streetlight, and they uh, gather uh, information mostly from uh, phones, uh, what are called location-based services. And we're able to uh, average out what a, what a typical trip takes uh, between Southbury and Seymour. And you know, typically, you know, about 90% of the trips are completed um, within 10 minutes. The average speed's about 35 to 40 miles an hour. So of course, that factors in any potential delay at the, you know, the several signalized intersections in the corridor. Uh, we were able to conduct what's called a spot speed study, where we um, basically at one point, essentially right where this photo is taken, right in Oxford Center, um, and it, it gathered data that showed traffic traveling about 43 miles an hour northbound on average, uh, 47 miles an hour southbound on average. And you know, one of the things that was interesting to us was, you know, based on this location, which is right at the north end of the not Oxford Center node, um, it shows you that that northbound traffic that's traveled through that more built up area with the church, with the police station, uh, with Oxford Baking uh, there on your left right before you get here. You know, they've passed through that developed area. Maybe that context has slowed them down just a little bit versus that southbound traffic is just coming into this developed area 
and is still going that little bit faster. You know, we also looked at safety on, you know, in particular on Route 67. Again, uh, most of the, the crashes are associated with the signalized intersections towards the southern part of the corridor. You know, the typical fender benders that we see in congested areas where vehicles line up at a traffic signal, uh, mostly rear end collisions, about, about a quarter of which end in injuries. You know, there was a fatality um, in a parking lot uh, just adjacent to Route 67 uh, just a couple of years ago as well. So you know, certainly looking to ensure that both vehicles and bicyclists and pedestrians are able to use Route 67 safely. A big goal for the study. In terms of pedestrian mobility, um, there's not a lot out there. And, and I don't think that'll surprise too many people. This, this, this map, um, you probably can't read much of the detail, but the, the real reason I like to show it is those blue lines are sidewalks. That yellow highlight is the, the study corridor. You can just see there's really nothing in there now. And I, I would say that there was a short stretch of about 1,000 feet uh, built right at Quarry Walk. But even, even with those on the map, it really doesn't show all that much. So, you know, there's really not much in the way of sidewalks, in particular along uh, Route 67. So when you think about that and pair that with the high speeds I talked about, the high traffic volumes, it does create a difficult environment uh, for walking your lawn 67 if you need to, uh, or for crossing it from point to point. I um, I always tell the story when I came down to do a site visit for this project, I had parked over in the school parking lot and I had taken my pictures and I saw that bakery over there and I was like, I'm going to go get myself a coffee. And you know, that's it, it's not a fun experience um, crossing right there. There's no crosswalk or anything, so the you know folks are just flying along. So. You know, it's a it it's definitely a tricky environment for pedestrians. There's a photo, and you can see that that narrowest shoulder too. And you know, a lot of places in the corridor do have guide rail, so you 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 can really feel constrained, pinned between that that fast moving traffic and the guide rail. It's an uncomfortable environment. Uh, so, secondly, when we talk about um, uh, active transportation, you know, we talk about bicycling and, you know, that can be for transportation, it could be for recreation. Um, and again, just want to link back to those, those higher, higher travel speeds, higher traffic volumes and, and how that relates to what we call cyclist comfort. So um, the agencies that govern transportation facilities uh, called AASHTO, the Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, has established standards for providing comfortable bike facilities, you know, a bike facility that should be able to be used by all users. Um, that's uh, kids with, uh, uh, you know, families with kids, you know, people like that, that it may not be comfortable, that, you know, those people that you see out there on Route 67 today. And so that comfort level is based on the amount of cars passing them and how fast those cars are going. And they've got a chart here that kind of outlines what type of facility you would use. And you know, for those lower volumes, those lower speeds, you could share the lane. Gets a little higher, you would go with a bicycle lane, which is basically the shoulder with some striping denoting that space. Bicyclists, and if and if volumes and speeds are getting even higher than that, they say you got to separate those. You got to create a separate path to allow those bicyclists to operate safely. And that's that navy blue area on my graph here. And so again, if I sort of plot where Route 67 is, it, it's almost off the page. So, you know, again, that really brings us to that recommendation, you know, that in, in order to provide a comfortable cyclist experience, you know, we're probably looking at a, what's called a, a shared use path or a side path. Now, that's not to say that, you know, kind of those expert riders, those, those long distance recreational riders wouldn't be allowed to uh, operate in the shoulder if they wanted to, you know, we don't want to stop them. But it's really to say that only they would essentially feel comfortable. Now, um, we have a lot more detail on existing conditions. Our uh, report has been posted uh, to the project website. Uh, and what I will do is I'll make sure we get a link into this presentation so that uh, once I post this presentation, people will be able to, to get to that as well. So we've started to look at what that sort of side path shared use trail could look like. And We've looked at the you know, environmental, we've looked at the physical constraints. Um, obviously, Route 67 parallels the Little River. And that's, you know, you, you know, they talked a little bit about it in the presentation the Main Street Committee did, you know, Kathleen and the, the, the Nature Preserve. And, you know, that, that river really is a, a resource for town. It's um, classified as a 
you know, high level trout managed stream. It's a you know great location to to fish, and it's just really a pristine natural asset for the for the community. So, you know, obviously paralleling Route 67, you know, we've been looking for opportunities to link the two together. You know, we did look at could we get the trail to follow along uh, the Little River, and you know, in some ways that's that's just a little difficult because of the topography, because of the fact that it's a managed floodway, and and, and sort of trying to keep the facility in a location that would be able to, to to get us a permit and then the the final thing is that you know that that river basically runs through private property and in order to build a trail along it there'd be quite a bit of property acquisition needed in order to get the trail through so you know that's one of the benefits of, of potentially putting the trail on route 67 be a little bit easier to proceed so in terms of what the trail could look like this is what we call a typical section and essentially what we'd like to try and do is create a little buffer, a minimum of five feet between the edge of Route 67, the curb, and where the walkway is. Five foot is essentially a minimum to not provide some sort of barrier or guide rail uh, between the facilities. Now, there will be locations where we have a steep drop off down to the river or some other um, uh, potential impediment where we may need to put that guide rail. Again, the, the guide rail is not there necessarily to, to protect someone walking on the road. It's more to establish a, a sort of longitudinal divider between the two facilities so that someone who kind of tripped and stumbled would, wouldn't necessarily just fall directly into the roadway. And that, that's based on that, like I said, that, that AASHTO guide. Now, uh, I'm going to sort of walk through a, a couple different pieces of of the trail and, and kind of how we see that fitting in with 367 and the surrounding characteristics. Um, so starting in Oxford Center, headed down towards Quarry Walk. So, you know, we, you know, you've heard Kathleen express this desire to create a more walkable downtown type environment in Oxford Center. There's, you know, there's stuff on both sides of the street. There's some churches, a couple restaurants, the bakery, town hall, and then there's quite a few side roads that access larger residential subdivisions. So we're, you know, we're interested in making sure that those residences, you know, that, that we're thinking about how folks who may, may want to walk down from their residential neighborhood up a side road could, you know, making sure that there are appropriate connections there as well. And then obviously through here, we have those commercial destinations and the, you know, Little River, Little River Nature Preserve uh, and other recreational uh, opportunities. So you know, as of today, the town is working on uh, constructing a side path along the west side of Route 67. It is the grayer line here, which would extend, you know, just about from Town Hall down off this page to Dutton Road. So again, that's a, that's about a ten foot wide by two minutes path on this uh, on this west side of Route 67, right in front of the nature preserve. Um, you know, really nice asset, a start to everything else. You know, we. You know, we envision, and I'm going to come back to this area north of town center, but we envision basically continuing that uh, with a potential side path. That's that, that green color. And then we do see a good opportunity here in the Oxford Center area to provide a second path there on the, the north side, or excuse me, on the east side uh, with town hall, uh, connecting to the church over here, and then, and then maybe at Academy Road, kind of providing that connection back. Um, we're also thinking about ways we could connect to the Larkin State Park Trail, and I'll have more on that in the future. But you know, one of the potential avenues for that is what's called a paper street that's a town-owned right-of-way. It's called Larky Road, and it would it extends up beyond Town Hall, and so that's one of the potential routes we're going to look at where a path could be extended up towards the Larkin State Park Trail. And these gold arrows here are, are looking to indicate those potential key. And we, we've put together a rendering of, of what this could look like. Um, so this is a, just kind of a little snapshot driving through Oxford Center could look like uh, with paths there on both sides. So again, you know, this, this path here, this path here, not there today. You know, those are uh, rendered uh, by uh, our, our, our great artist, Nick Cavadas from Malone McBroom, who I believe is on uh, with us. Then as we think about, you know, how does this extend to the south, um, 
shown again in the gray coming in from the left is is that you know again in design going to be constructed relatively soon um, sidewalk that's being designed up to Dutton Road. So that kind of brings us over past the state street. So you know our thought is we you know we'll continue that. Then there's a signalized intersection with Ridge Street. South of Ridge Street, the topography gets really challenging. There's a there's a bridge in, in close proximity over the Little River. So we are going to look at continuing the trail on this side. We're also going to look at an alternative that would utilize this signalized intersection, cross folks across, and build the path parallel. Uh, this is Route 42, um, known as the, the Chestnut Tree Hill Road Extension. Follow that over the um, through Victory Memorial Park and come back around and, and cross um, the river, or excuse me, cross Route 67 back to the to the west side, down a little bit further south where the sight lines are pretty good. Um, so again, we're going to look at both alternatives. We, you know, we think there could be the you know potential need to really cut into this rock slope, and and that could could prove a little costly. So we're going to look at both of these options, and you know that'll be looked at as the study progresses. Um, and then again, we do have those neighborhood connections where we're, we're thinking about up Ridge Street and then connecting through Academy Road as well. As we continue to the south, we we kind of come into another area where we've got a real um, real tight topographical area. These lines you can see here are contours. This is a real steep hill coming down. So we do think it will be beneficial to cross ourselves um, over to the west side of, of Route 67. And again, we're, we are really trying to minimize the amount of times we need to cross. We understand, uh, you know, the potential um, issues there, you know, for the most part, trying to keep those at signalized intersections. But we are, you know, giving a look to where those crossings could happen and making sure they're at safe locations. We've got a rendering of, of what that could look like uh, on, on the next slide. Uh, so again, you know, following along here on the west side and then bringing ourselves and connecting into Quarry Walk. So they've already got some sidewalk constructed at Quarry Walk. So we'd just be essentially widening that to a, to a center. Here's just a rendering of what that crossing could look like. Again, we'd be looking to, you know, draw attention to the fact that there's a crossing. We'll, we'll explore different crossing solutions. There are some, you know, technologies that do provide a little bit more advanced warning to motorists and, and alert them to the fact that that's going on. As we continue uh, down towards Seymour, uh, you know, that commercial density does eventually start to build up a little bit. There is a long kind of rural stretch right after Quarry Walk, but after that you start to see some of these plazas, a little bit more uh, density of use. And there's still, of course, the recreational destinations um, associated with the Little River. And then, of course, we do want to try and continue this towards to downtown Seymour, potential destinations there, as well as the Ting Dam and the, the, the Nautilus River Greenway. So again, you know, we've got another location where we've got a couple options here. We, you know, we're going to investigate a potential spur along Old State Route 67, again, kind of given the challenging terrain associated with the floodplain and, and, and some of the topography here along 67. But again, we want to make sure any crossings are really vetted well in terms of what they could look like. But then, you know, really just continuing uh, south along the west side of Route 67, uh, this is just an example of, of, of what the trail could look like um, in a little bit more constrained location where maybe a retaining wall might be needed. Um, we've got some guide rail there uh, between that condition that I showed where the you know, ability to provide that five foot buffer And again, you know, our, our, our vision is, is that the, the trail would con continue along the west side. There's some nice open space um, between the river and the road that could provide some additional opportunities for people to pause, recreate. And then we start to connect, you know, at these signalized intersections, access to some of these plazas, and then a big run of activity here on the, the west side of the and again, so we, you know, we, we generally see that that trail continuing potential uh, signalized intersection crossing at Great Hill Road uh, towards the Little River again, where it opens up a little bit uh, as we approach the, the Seymour Town Line. And so we've now we're, we're now at that Seymour Town Line. This is at CVS at signalized intersection with West Street. So we're going to continue to investigate ways that we can provide connections uh, over to uh, downtown Seymour. So just uh, those will be coming um, in future documents. 
Now I'm going to kind of jump back up to Oxford Center and, and, and head to the north. And, you know, it, you know, it's a little bit more spread out. Things are, you know, a little bit more rural in character, you know, still looking at those recreational opportunities and, you know, maybe getting some ice cream, right? Um, and, and, and ensuring that those neighborhoods are provided that opportunity to, to, to connect uh, down to Route 67 and any trail. Coming north from uh, the municipal center, this is that uh, the bus depot. You're continuing on the west side. You know, maybe looking at a potential spur along uh, the old state route there, but you know, primarily continuing along the west side. We see now this is really the typical section of of, of what the trail could look like here. On one side, a you know, nice five foot buffer or so um, there on the, the between the roadway. And so our, our vision at uh, this point is is essentially that the you know trail would primarily be on the, the west side um, as we continue up towards um, Southbury. Uh, again, another potential spur that we're going to look at the potential benefits of uh, along Old State Route Two, and then uh, you know Holly Road um, is one of the uh, another potential place we we could put a path parallel to it to connect up to the Larkin State Park Trail. And I skipped over it, but there is. Um, Another location we would look to do that at, at Christmas Street. So again, what are the next steps for us is, is, is looking at the pros and cons, understanding the cost and the benefits of, of those optional routings, uh, looking at the crossing locations, working with our partners at Connecticut DOT to ensure that you know that's something they'll accept, that it's a you know, safe location to be crossing the roadway, how we can make it safe, um, and looking at uh, planning level cost estimates trying to understand how to, uh, you know, how to piece this together given the, the current funding environment. And then the one thing I haven't talked about yet so far is, is transit. And you know, certainly at the moment, there is no uh, transit within town. Um, there, there are services in Seymour and Naugatuck um, operated by both the Connecticut Transit Waterbury and New Haven divisions. And and the um, uh, Valley Transit District operates paratransit in, in several other towns south of us. So, when, you know, we wanted to understand what the demand would be. I mean, you know, Oxford is certainly not a you know heavily urbanized community. It's a, you know relatively rural, what we call a bedroom community. You know, most of the commuters are going out, and then most people who work in Oxford are coming in, and they're coming from all kinds of different places. We looked up some of the census data. And you know it's really all over the place. I mean, the, the highest um, destination for folks that work outside of Oxford is, is Shelton, and it has like five percent. So you know, think about how many you know destinations that means there are. So we did some calculations looking at what demand would be, and so this looks at things like um, folks over sixty-five, folks with a disability, folks you know who it may be hard to get around. And and also, you know, folks from an income level who, who may be looking for, you know, may not own a vehicle. And you know, so we found, a, you know, about 13,600 rides per year. And, and, you know, that that amounts to a need for about two paratransit vehicles, sort of like the one I have. pictured. And, you know, we looked at potential commuter services. But at the end of the day, you know, we kind of think the demand is too limited. It's too sparse. Um, you know, it just would kind of create a long commute. And we looked at providing connections to the, you know, something that would be a commuter service to the, the Seymour train station. And, you know, at the end of the day, it just seemed like the commute length would be too long. Um, so, you know, while we would still certainly have the, you know, look at a service that provides that connection, we just don't see a particularly high. Demand. So we're in the process of looking through four different options. One would be a, a fixed route that could be added to the Waterbury division. Again, you know, I think we're, we're, we're probably seeing that the demand isn't going to quite add up to the cost on that. So I think of these three um, um, latter options, I think, you know, potentially having Oxford join the Valley Transit District and, and have that paratransit service operator, that's a demand response. That means you, have, you essentially call up and, 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 and tell them when you need to be picked up and you, you schedule your ride. Um, or the town could operate something like that, a demand response system. So there are grant opportunities out there. You know, I always point to uh, the town of Enfield uh, in northern Connecticut uh, runs a service called the Magic Carpet. So it, it's not out of the realm of possibility for municipalities to do that. 
And then uh, a, a final option is, is to subsidize ride sharing. So you can contract with Uber and Lyft uh, to set essentially a, a very low base fare that um, folks in town could pay for a ride to Quarry Walk or to Seymour or to Southbury. Um, so those are some of the options we're going to look at, again, looking at the you know, potential demand for them and, as well as the potential cost. So wrapping up our study, um, you know, we're going to continue to work through the trail routing with the committee, develop more CAD drawings, like I said, higher level costs, work with our partners at DOT, looking to wrap that up by 2021. Um, we do expect to be able to get some conclusions on the transit component this fall. Uh, so working hard at that. And then, you know, again, this whole thing we're expecting to wrap up in the late spring of next year. And, and we envision uh, uh, having another one of these public forums. Hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to, to do that in person and get out and meet some folks um, um, by spring 2021. But obviously, we'll, we'll have to see in this, uh, in this new and different time for all of us. Um, you know, I'm just really happy that folks were able to join us. So we do have a few uh, ways to, to, to kind of weigh in um, on uh, you know, social media. We have a Facebook and a, and a Twitter account. Um, we've uh, been working with Jim Sanders, um, who runs the uh, Facebook group um, the, uh, in Oxford to um, get that out there. And hopefully some of you have started to join that. We're starting to publish some of our materials there. There's an open portal on our on, on the Nautatuck Valley COD website um, where people can just comment at any time. And then we do have a survey that's live right now. And if you want, you could click that. That's a link right there. You could click that, I think, and um, and you'd be able to um, um, go in and, and, and take a 15, 20 uh, question survey that we've got up right now. Um, so that's about it for the presentation. Um, so I haven't been able to see any of the screens yet. I'm sorry. So I got one hand, so not quite as many as I, as I thought we might. So all right. So we're going to pause and, and, and do some questions here. Um, OK, so let me start first with Jim. So Jim will allow you to unmute. Hello? I can hear you. You're a little faint, but we can hear you. OK, yeah, I'm on speakerphone. I actually had to unmute a different way because I'm on my cell phone dialing differently. So question for you about the way up to South Ferry. Has there been any thought about trying to get the connection over to Southford Falls State Park? If you're yeah, all the way no, up it is. To... It's um, it's it's on our our bigger um, map that 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 isn't quite as much of an executive summary. Yes, that is um one of the destinations we um we want to make sure we're thinking about linking. Okay, that was that was the only thing I saw in uh in that. So I'll, I'll go back on you. Thank you, Jim. And then I um, I see a comment uh, from Chris about uh, there being sidewalks at the CVS area. Yes, that there are the, um, the sidewalks do come up from Seymour and they end. I think they end right at about the town line, um, but or, or maybe right at that CVS at West Street. So, yeah, that that's sort of what at a minimum we we know we need to try and connect to from a from a pedestrian. All right, um, we are happy to take any further questions. Um, Chris, thank you for reposting the or uh, posting the survey monkey link. I guess it doesn't work when I just put it in the presentation. Yeah, I think I think that's right. They do end up. All All right, I saw, I've seen a few guests um, headed out. Um, again, happy to hang out for a few minutes if anyone wants to uh, ask any questions or um, you know, just, just send us a chat. I'll, uh, I'll hang out here for a few minutes, but thank you again for joining us. Um, really appreciate it. I don't know, Kathleen, if you wanted to say anything to wrap up or Aaron. No, just thank you for uh, coming to the, uh, the meeting and hopefully as we progress, we'll have more in the future. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming out. Um, 
if you're looking for more information, you can find it on the NVCOG website, um, at least for the for the uh, study. And that's um, NVCOGCT.gov. All right, I'll say good good night, uh, Aaron, AC, and and all our uh, participants. Unless we have any further discussion, I see uh, uh, Raina has a note, and I, I totally agree. I, I um the the plan is to minimize the the times we need to cross Route sixty seven and. You know, essentially, the only reason we do it is just really, you know, make sure we do it at a location where we can establish, establish you know, good sight lines, provide suitable, um, suitable services, you know, potentially what's called a hawk system, or there's a couple of other different ways you can, you can try and enhance safety. But I totally agree. And, you know, quite a few of those places we were showing those crossovers would be at signalized intersections. That would certainly be the, um, the priority. But no, that's a good point. Thank you. Sure. No, I mean, we get it. Yeah, the traffic volumes are high. Um, you know, I you know one of the things that we do start we we do want to make sure we think about is the the, the cars impeding the pedestrians flow too. But I, I get your point. It is um, um, it's not ideal to have those crossings um, at an unsignalized location. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we um, uh, Matthews Park. We um, we had that on our map too. Our our bigger, broader. Um, outline of, of of locations we, we we wanted to think about connections to. Um, I, I don't know that that this would lay out kind of a specific. Um, are, are you talking about the one in Beacon Falls? Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I think it's another one of those places we want to think about how all this ties together because. You know, there's certainly the um, the Nautifex State Forest over there as well, and, and it's not too far up um, Route 42. And you know, maybe there's a way to kind of identify, um, you know, another pair, you know, a path, you know, a path that really creates a, a big connection. I, you know, one of the things the committee started all this with is the idea of creating an unbroken triangle between the Larkin Trail, the Nautifex Greenway, and I think that you know that would be just another key destination to. to Don't I? The only one I see in the map is the one in Beacon Falls, but uh, will there be a larger shoulder? Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. Um, I. I at this point, you know, the focus of this is alternative transportation. So that's bicycling, walking, and uh, and transit. And, you know, at the moment, I think when we did the, the review of the shoulder widths, for the most part, they meet the standards for a roadway and sort of a minimum of four feet. Um, they're not as wide as, as you'd want them in order to operate as a bicycle lane. I think I think our recommendations are probably going to focus on the provision of a trail. <clears throat> Casey, can we hear the questions that you're being asked? Because we're not. Oh, I'm sorry. I, you know, I, I, um, I keep, uh, yeah, I'm just like reading them and responding to them. So that last question was whether there'd be a larger area from the fog line to the safety rail for possible breakdown. Sorry. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll try and read them out loud from the back. 
you guys must have been thinking I was nuts just having a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Inventing questions. Any, uh, so Jim Sanders says anything considered for 188. 188's not um, specifically part of the study, but um, you know I think one of the ways I know when I first thought about how a connection could happen to the Larkin State Park Trail, you know I did see the opportunity if we could extend up into the kind of Southford area, some of the um, some of the commercial developments there could be good destinations. And then just providing that connection up 188 to the Larkin State Park Trail. Um, that's sort of the limits of the study area, but I think that would be something that could be beneficial and certainly one of the avenues we'd explore for connecting to the uh, Larkin State Park Trail. Uh, so uh, Jim added there might be an interest in walking a route around the old houses on. 188 in 67 or on 67. Um, yeah, I, I, I could, I can certainly envision. It. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, I think um, the scope for this, what, you know, does kind of stop at the town line, but I think that's a good idea. And again, we'll, you know, we'll try and weave in language and, you know, maybe there's a way uh, from a stakeholder perspective to, um, touch base with Southbury and you know I think at some point you know we'd probably like to do that just to kind of let them know about the terminus for our um, for our trail and, and where that ends up and what that could connect to. And, and there are grants that that really honor collaborative work between towns so that's always a possibility when they come out for example to collaborate with Seymour on widening their sidewalks or Southbury to so that's always a possibility. One eighty eight is the other road in Oxford. I've walked on one eighty eight to see the uh, the old houses. Same type of shoulder as Route sixty seven. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't doubt. It. I think um, a lot of the um, state roadways are, you know, especially those that are. The arterials and the like probably just have about that four to five foot shoulder. And, and there. Is there any funding regarding maintenance of the trails? Um, so that's that's a good question. Um, regarding what? The maintenance of the trails. <laughs> no. You can. Uh, they don't, they don't, that's part of what they want from the uh, the person that's getting the grant. They want to know that it's going to be maintained by a municipal or, you know, whoever, whoever is getting the grant. So that's something in the, in uh, that Casey uh, is working on. How do we keep those, uh, the uh, invasives, uh, Dead. How do we? Uh, that that's a yearly, quite a few year process to keep to actually kill the knockweed. And um, even with the uh, preserve itself, uh, they're going to want to know how are we going to maintain, repair, or, you know, what kind of funding will we have uh, to do that? But no, they don't usually give grants to to actually get that done. Okay, so first comment was hiking trails uh, within the preserve can be maintained by a volunteer group. That was Jim. And then uh, Joe Mannion asked, will the trails be plowed in the winter? So that is, um, we've got bingo for our, uh, for our normal trail maintenance uh, questions. So you know, that, that's always a tricky, I mean, it kind of depends on the town. They can be plowed. Um, you know, I know a lot of municipalities will get a, um, a 10 foot um, um, plow. So that's a choice. You know, that's something that we'll have to continue to talk to the t town. I mean, when it's a sidewalk versus a trail, that's a difference. And the trail can be closed in the winter. Some places go that route. But again, like I said, 10 foot's wide enough that if, if the town can you know, find a way to fund the purchase of a smaller plow, 
if you know you can plow it with a machine rather than kind of shovel it by hand. So that that's a question. That's something that will be continue to be um, um, looked at down the line. And then so the follow up is: will, will there be any liability regarding any accidents on the trail? So that's a good question, and I I'll be honest, I don't know the answer well, to that. Um, well, it's, Aaron, town, it's town owned land, Casey. So yep. yes, it's covered by our insurance. Yep. So there you go. So we cover by town insurance. Mm. When would the project begin if all goes well? So I think, Kathleen, if you want to explain the community connectivity sidewalk, that, that would be the first thing people would see besides the nature preserve. Yeah, we, have, we received round two of community connectivity grant for $398,000. And then any soft costs were covered by uh, our Board of Finance and Board of Selectmen. And that is going out to bid this week. Uh, so, uh, it's been approved. It's, uh, ready to go. Now the work probably won't start until early spring, but we will have a, a, a GP for that. And then a miracle happened. The second, uh, the third round of Conne uh, Connecticut community connectivity grant came out with a $600,000 cap. And now we're able to uh, complete the preserve with the bridge going over the Little River. Um, uh, the first grant that's going, that's going out to bid uh, will give us a 10 foot walkway bicycle way along the south side or opposite the town hall. Plus it will uh, have a, a paving of quite a bit of the uh, trail um, and the, the uh, sidewalk will include the uh, lighting and um, benches and uh, within the trail uh, area and also within the street. The new grant, which I, I'm trying to get it done by the 16th, um, will now mirror that streetscape on the side of the town hall side and go down, I think, from uh, the other side of the uh, of the town hall all the way down to Academy Street, uh, uh, and um, we'll have the you know the lamps and the and the um, uh, benches also mirroring uh, what, what what's going to be done across the street. In the preserve itself, it's going to have money for the eradication of the knockweed. Knockwood. Uh, it's going to have money to Broadwalk, the uh, part of the trail that is in the wetlands, uh, obviously that's what the study is going to be. It's going to identify important trees and plants that have to be moved off the trail, but kept in the preserve. It's going to have an archway of outdoor forum that could be used uh, for a classroom. Uh, and that's where your, your memorial benches will be, your memorial bricks. Uh, and uh, that will lead to a 60-foot bridge. Unfortunately, I mean, you know how, how narrow that river is, but uh, in order to get solid land for the abutments, it's going to probably be around 60 feet. That's going to be fiberglass, and uh, once the abutments are in, the company will come and place that bridge on top of those abutments, and it saves a lot of money. Uh, we're still working on the cost estimate. And then this bridge will bring us over to, I haven't been there, but everyone says that it's pristine Connecticut landscape. And we don't have that very often with the invasives. Uh, but they haven't gone over the river. So uh, Jim and his group are uh, claiming it and, uh, and uh, are going to uh, provide a beautiful uh, hiking trail. It'll be about a half a mile. 
So when you want to go have a, a cup of coffee and a donut and then meet friends for a short walk and then go pay your taxes and <laughs> you'll be able to do all that in one in one uh, one day, one afternoon. But that's pretty much, uh, there's going to be other things, but that's pretty much the scope of the work of both grants. Now, the, the money for, Aaron is still here, the money, uh, we did apply for a set-aside transportation a grant. Uh, we're contingent, we're second one in line in case people don't um, take their grant. There are times when towns will give back their money. Uh, so we're in the running for that money, and that would fund from uh, the Academy Road pretty much down to Quarry Walk. And I think that budget was around a million eight. And then from Quarry Walk down to Seymour, there's a loss of grant that we're uh, got dibs on. And uh, uh, so it's there that, you know, we're, uh, we're going to keep our eye out once uh, our, our routing, uh, alternate routing is done. Uh, we'll have the wherewithal to know what is the best and most pro uh, economically feasible way to go. What, what are the best uh, materials to use? So it's very important what Casey's work is and Aaron's. <clears throat> I thank you. That's a good explanation. And um, there have been a couple little questions. Um, first was from Jim. When will the memorial benches be available to buy? Any idea how much they might be? Uh, we're, we're thinking that just the plaques alone are, they're bronze and they are, uh, they are uh, weatherproof. Uh, they will they will uh, be approximately 225 for a bench and a memorial a plaque. Uh, that is going to be on our website, Jim. Uh, the bricks and the and the benches uh, and the plaques that can go. Some plaques can go on on large rocks. They can go on benches. Uh, I was going to present it tonight, but we were just not ready yet. Okay. Yeah, because I will probably buy one of those plaques for the memorial benches so no great great and and that's going to be going to the corporation and and that's going to help maintain uh give our funding for maintenance and of course uh remember the center is going to be the old police department so i've got to look for money and funding for that but uh i know uh we have several people very interested in the benches there's only going to be seven at this time so uh uh, thanks for the for that, Jim. Yeah. And, and then and we had the another. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jim. Uh, and th definitely for those who are interested, the trail that's on the west side of Little River, right by the Little River Nature Preserve. I've lo I've looked it over there. It's definitely pretty pristine. I didn't really see very many invasive species species on the west side. You know, maybe there there's a few, but if we get them early, you know, we can take care of them. Fairly. But it looks pretty looks pretty clean over on the other side. No, thankfully, thankfully, that's getting more rare as time goes by. It's just terrible. So but in November, uh, Stacy will be in there with her crew, uh, taking down the fall, taking the fallen trees out. We're going to leave some, obviously, for the critters. Uh, but that's going to be a, a, and people will then start to see, oh, it's starting. The, the Main Street project is starting. And then early for, uh, spring, there, those, those sidewalks and walkways, and then hopefully I'll get the, an award for this round three, and we'll have a lot done by this time next year, hopefully. Thanks to all the people that have, you know, contributed the the, the committee uh, meeting, uh, Jim uh, with uh, helping with the uh, uh, group, Oxford Main Street group. I mean, it, it's just been uh, when we needed help, uh, it seems that we got it. And uh, now let's keep our fingers crossed for the for any grants or funding that'll come our way. And and uh, Nogatuck Valley Cog, uh, Aaron's group. Uh, has been such a support. Uh, Christian Meyer, all the people that, uh, you know, I, I used to see at least once a month or twice a month, 
uh, now with the virtual meetings, I, I it's not in right in the forefront, but uh, Cog has been a very great supporter of uh, of this project. Uh, we did have one other question that I think has already been answered. It was, I hope what is being used uh, for the knotweed and other invasives won't impact the river. And then Mary said, no, that everything that's being used is environmentally friendly. Well, we did have uh, the Thule group and the Housatonic Valley come in, but then COVID kind of stopped everything. Right now, from what uh, Stacy said, and she wrote the guidelines for the state uh, on how to get rid of this knockweed, uh, it has to be excavated out of there. You have to get a bobcat or something. You're not if you cut it down and then cover it. It's not going to do any. It's not going to do any good. Yeah. And even with the excavating, uh, there's a special vinyl, black vinyl, that will be put on. And then this has to be done uh, annually. You have to check that area out. Uh, but that's a learning lesson in and of itself. People better start to realize that these invasives, uh, these invasive plants are taking over our uh, Connecticut landscape. And that in, in itself will be one of the lessons uh, held at the preserve. But uh, we have we have that, that's gonna be in the next grant. We will have monies to, to do it the right way. According to Stacy, yeah, Kath, um, the question yeah. was, <clears throat> she just wanted to make sure that nothing would impact uh, the river, you know, of that course. everything was going to be, and it's going to be environmentally done, and Stacy is, is uh, has written all the guidelines for that. Uh, absolutely. I mean, that's the whole point. We don't want to, I mean, we don't, we're not doing a park across the street. It's going to be uh, a preserve, so... Your jack in the pulpit and your ferns and your typical uh, uh, wetlands, uh, vegetation, trees and animals, we have to protect them. And and then uh, hopefully in the center, uh, people will will understand how important th these areas are in our in our uh, in our on our land. Um, yeah, and I think Stacy's one of the best, and she wants to teach. Uh, teach some of these lessons and that's what i mean by being uh so blessed having people come and and contribute what their what their forte is and uh, uh it's been wonderful how are we doing casey no uh no additional questions yet um well, they, they know, you know, they know they're always uh, able to reach me at grant admin, grant admin, uh, and Oxford-CT.gov. So uh, I'll be happy to hear from them. I was so excited to hear from the Girl Scouts. They're going to bring their their kids in. So that's that's wonderful. So Raina said, thank you for all the information. Thank you for joining us. And thanks for all the questions. We appreciate your interest. And thanks, Casey. Thanks, Aaron. And Mary, thank you. Oh, thank you, everyone. All right. Safe trip. I know you're all in your living. <laughs> we don't have to drive home. No one's driving home. All Thanks, right. Good night. Thank you. Have, have a good night. Good night. Be safe. Thank you, Casey. Good job. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Well, at least we got a few questions. It wasn't, I don't know that we got a huge uh, attendance. 
hopefully we can um, get the loop around. And... Can you oh, hear me? Yep, you can stop recording probably, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Stop recording.